What does Stanford, the Stanky Legs, T Pain, and podcasts have in common? Hmm. Sounds like another episode of Insecure. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is D Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today I'm coming to you all with another episode of Insecure, Season 5, Episode 1, Reunited. Okay. Yes, 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 we are back. This is our season premiere, and to be more specific, it is our last and final season premiere, but you know what? I'm not going to worry about that right now. This episode was directed by the Melina Masukas. She is a two-time Grammy Award winner and four-time MTV Music Video Awards winner for her direction of the music videos We Found Love featuring Rihanna and Calvin Harris and Formation featuring Beyonce. If you look up her filmography, you'll see that she has directed countless music videos for all kinds of artists, including Eve, Leona Lewis, Solange, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Sierra, Rihanna, Beyonce, the legendary Whitney Houston, and countless others. She also made her directorial debut back in 2019 with Queen and Slim. She's also directed multiple episodes of Insecure, including our very first premiere episode back in 2016, Insecure AF, as well as our season two premiere, Hella Great, in 2017. So of course, it's more than fitting that we have her back to direct our last season premiere for season five. If I really had to sum this episode up, I would say the theme here was growth, change, making tough decisions, and really trying to make sense of the impact that you want to make in life with your life. So we open up this episode with some very beautiful shots of the highway and the landscape and the mountains. And if you have been watching the show as long as I have, then you already know that most, if not all, of the time that you're watching these episodes, you gotta have your Shazam on and you gotta like be ready. (laughs) Because that soundtrack, the music consulting, the selection, the curating, all of that, I think it has been widely and universally accepted that the music on Insecure just hits different. And this episode, of course, is no different. And our opening track here is Master P by the artist Choker. So apparently someone, or some people, are in the midst of a road trip. And it turns out to be none other than Derek, Tiffany, and Kelly. And of course, Kelly is being extra as usual. She's scrolling through her timeline and reacting to everything she sees. Derek's like, I will drive us off a cliff. (laughs) So Derek isn't here for it. And Tiffany isn't really feeling it either. They briefly touch on Molly and that it's been two months since her breakup with Andrew and that she's really going through it right now. But Tiffany feels like, you know what? This weekend is just for us. Let's not talk about Molly's mess. Let's not talk about Issa's messy mess. Speaking of which, we see our girl, the one and only Issa D, arriving at the San Francisco International Airport. So she quickly jumps into her car and we are ready to pull off, but no, we can't because that is not her driver and it's not her car. (laughs) She hops right on out and she's looking through the various cars like, Tamir, Tamir. Okay, somebody lying. (laughs) We fast forward to Stanford University, which of course is everyone's alma mater. We see Issa joining the crew and she's happy to see everybody and she sees Molly and she gives her a hug and it's clear there's still a little bit of awkwardness there but for the most part all is well. And as you may recall in the season four finale they finally were able to sit down and air their grievances, have the conversation that they needed to have at the beginning of the season but regardless they were able to sit down and talk and now they're just in the stages of rebuilding and trying to get back and click the way they used to. I'm actually kind of irritated that we didn't get to see any of that conversation because I think it would have been interesting to see like what the dynamics of the conversation was, like who felt what way about this and the back and forth and just the general, you know, purpose of the conversation. I think that would have been really interesting and impactful to see, but whatever, new season, I suppose we're moving on. But in addition to attending their class reunion, everyone is here to support Issa because she is going to be speaking on a special panel. And there she'll be representing her new company, The Block. Black life, opportunities, culture, and connection. Now, Issa didn't quite say it as easily as I did. She was kind of like, you know, the seeds were throwing her off. But anyway, The Block is here and she's ready to show it to the world. 
However, the mood for the moment is prominently disrupted when Kelly realizes that she has been featured on the In Memoriam page in what looks like a retrospective book, meaning that everyone thinks that she's dead. Kelly is not happy at first, but then she decides to flip it around and she's like, you know what? Maybe this just means that it's time to test out my new identity. For starters, French. Uh -huh -huh. And Derek is just like, um, is that an identity or a language? And I was just like, look, <laughs> We cannot go down this road with the accents again because of course we all remember the big block party debacle last season where Kelly was trying to impress old dude and she had her British accent going talking about how she was from Poppycock and she was just a biscuit toss away from Benny Hill. <laughs> I was just like, can we not, please? <laughs> We see the group walking around campus and Tiffany calls out the fact that Issa clearly doesn't know the majority of the people because whenever the person says, hey, she's like, hey, voice just cracking and squeaky. I was like, you can always tell when that pitch goes just a little bit too high that something ain't right. Molly decides to ask Kelly what it was like for her and Tiffany when they had fallen out and when they were in the midst of rebuilding their friendship. I mean, like, how long did it take for you guys to get like back back? Kelly's like, well, we were fake back before we were back back. It was a whole bunch of jokes I laughed at that weren't even funny. But you know what? It's a process. I would say in the meantime, just give it time, be there for her, support her, and eventually it all come back together. We jump over to a mixer that's happening on campus. I was cracking up at old girl like getting down like on the flute to too short, blow the whistle. I was like, man. The girls take some time to reconnect with an old friend named Cheyenne. And by the girls, I mean Issa, Molly, and Kelly. Because Tiffany's like, mm-mm, she was too wild for me. Which is not surprising. Tiffany seems like she only really enjoys being around respectable, upper-class, bourgeois black folks like herself. <laughs> I mean, Kelly, Molly, and Issa are the exception, but for the most part, it's not her scene. And Cheyenne definitely ain't her scene. Because I think we can all tell that Tiffany does not do hood or ratchet at all. <laughs> Cheyenne actually left Stanford to go dance on tour with Sierra, and now she's returned. And by returned, I mean snuck in because she ain't trying to pay for anything. We also see Molly reconnecting with an old friend with benefits, or perhaps in this case, just friend, because according to Molly, she was the only one supplying any benefits. Kelly's experience with death continues when she sees herself featured on the In Memoriam presentation. And the quotes that people have said about her aren't exactly distinctive. She always made me laugh. She had the best thank you leg. She always carried a purse. <laughs> I was just like, we can't do any better than that. Kelly is clearly not pleased, but there's no time to worry about that because thank you leg by GS Boys comes on. And of course, with that kind of music, you just can't help it. Even if you're not a fan of it, it's just like, dude, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But <laughs> you already know what time it is. Next, we see Mira Issa make an appearance, but this isn't our typical Mira Issa. This is actually throwback Issa, complete with dark hair, twists, and braces. And in this little tete-a-tete, -tete, shall we say, Issa is having to navigate the choices and the dreams and the goals that she had in mind at that age and how that really has changed now that she's a working professional adult. For example, being a lawyer and starting a law firm with Molly. Well, didn't actually want to be a lawyer, so that fell by the wayside. Meeting T-Pain, uh, didn't quite work out, but there's still time. Relationship, not really a thing right now. And because Mirror Issa represents Issa's inner voice slash conscience, we can see that this throwback version is almost dissatisfied with this future version of herself, which is actually relatable because if we go back in our mind, we can always think about what we wanted to be at a certain age and how we saw ourselves in the future and how that may or may not line up with who we are now. So I understand that, but it is also so counterproductive because ultimately it does not help you to see the value in where you are right now. But all this personal reflection is gonna have to wait because it is time for the panel, which is called Finding Your Path, Advice from Alumni Entrepreneurs. The host asked Issa what her biggest lesson was on her journey in creating the Blow CC. And she's like, um, well, one of course is realizing that I screwed up on the logo because it's the block. <laughs> but she learned how to be authentic with her ideas and her passions. And the fact that she has pride in her city, that's what really drives her. Unfortunately, it is dead silent in the room. No camaraderie, no head nods, no laughs, just nothing. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, I was just a 
little bit triggered. <laughs> Just a little bit because I have struggled often throughout my life with comparison and feeling like my voice really didn't matter or had any value. Mind you, I understand now that everyone is different and that we all have something to offer. But in situations like this, which I've been in, it didn't look quite like this, but in comparison to other people, sometimes how I was received in situations that I was in, it really made me second guess myself and if it was worth it to even have a voice or to be vocal or to even express myself. Ironically enough, even when it comes to this YouTube journey, because initially I was not gonna be on camera and you know I didn't know how I was gonna do this and it really kept me from doing this whole YouTube thing years ago because I didn't have a lot of faith and confidence that anyone would want to sit here and watch me just talk on camera about who knows what. But thankfully, I am going through this process of unlearning that and uh, it just so happens that this YouTube journey is helping with that. And I am just having to get over that and understand that there is value in my perspective. There is purpose in what I have to say. And just because it doesn't look like someone else or sound like someone else or isn't even received in the same way as someone else doesn't make it any less valuable. So despite this thing being extremely awkward and cringeworthy, <laughs> It actually resonated with me. Afterwards, everyone is congratulating Issa. They're so proud of her. But you can tell Issa is just feeling kind of dejected, kind of downcast, like, you know, whatever. And Molly decides to take the initiative and have some one-on-one -on -one personal time with Issa just to talk to her and just to see where her head is at. The reason why Issa is frustrated is that she felt like being on this panel and being amongst these entrepreneurs, she felt like it was going to help her feel like, hey, I'm somebody and I've gotten somewhere, but it actually did the opposite. Molly tells Issa that she actually appreciated what she had to say because it was honest and it was real. And her being willing to put herself out there like that was pretty inspiring. And overall, I appreciated that Molly really did take Kelly's advice and that she's really just trying to support Issa and affirm her and encourage her. And I just thought that was really, really awesome. Definitely a step in the right direction. I swear I was thrilled when I saw that free shuttle driving around the campus because the one at my campus at the university that I went to looked almost exactly the same. I was just like, oh, the memories. Later we see Issa, Molly, Tiffany, Kelly, and Cheyenne listening to I Love Your Girl by The Dream. It's funny because I never actually got into The Dream and I had no idea who he was personally. Like I knew he was an artist, but I didn't know who he was really until he married Christina Milian. And then some not so nice things happened between the two of them. And then, you know, then I figured out, oh, okay, like I understand that he has a whole career, but unfortunately that was my introduction to him. But I will definitely say that on the 50 Shades Darker soundtrack, he has a song called Cold Blue and yes, I love that song. It's actually sitting on my playlist right now. Anyway, Kelly is not having the best time and you can see she's really irritated because this whole fake death situation is really painting a not so great picture of herself. When she was at the band reunion, one of the trombonists told her that she remembered that Kelly was allergic to kale. And Kelly's just like, so you can remember that, but not the fact that I took all those Mandarin tests for you? Everyone else is just like laughing and yucking it up. They're like, oh, remember the rap about Kelly being allergic to kale? And you know, they're rapping the lyrics and they're yucking it up. And Kelly's just like, look, like you don't get it. Like you completely missing the point. Like, is everything I do a joke to y'all? She is completely over it. And I thought that was really interesting because I think for so many people, Kelly is a very beloved character. She's lively, she's funny, she's personable, she's so many things. But I also think on the flip side, a lot of people struggle with Kelly as a character because she hasn't really gotten any development. And even Natasha Rothwell as an actress, you know, she really brings Kelly to life with her performance. I think some people are just frustrated by the fact that Kelly is basically playing into the big, loud, black, funny woman stereotype. And as a result, there's not much else that we get from her. And I can see that because if you think about it, even with Tiffany, Tiffany at one point was kind of a more one dimensional character. But even with this last season, we saw a lot of depth with her postpartum depression and her struggling with that. And we got some additional insight into her as a character. So that leaves just Kelly as the only character who hasn't gotten that. So I think that this whole story arc for Kelly is one, the character is kind of addressing those concerns by the audience. And then jumping back into the show for Kelly, 
I think it's just a matter of looking at her life and kind of questioning the impact. Like, what have I really done? (laughs) And what kind of impression have I really left on people? So to make a long story short, Molly, Issa, and Cheyenne get robbed by some guy. And because Cheyenne is just like, oh my gosh, you know, please don't hurt me. Like making all this noise. The guy's like, shut up, Shy. Issa and Molly are like, did you just set us up? Yes, of course she did. Why? Because she's Cheyenne. This is the same woman who scammed her way into the reunion. She knows who the robber is. She knows that his name is Brian. And to add insult to injury, now that she's been found out, she's still gonna rob them. It ain't nothing personal. Everybody can get it. <laughs> I was like, what kind of low budget hood boogery mess is this? So sadly, Issa and Molly get ganked. But ironically enough, when they're recounting the story to Kelly and Tiffany, they actually start cracking up and they are laughing and they're just like, oh my God. Did you see like, what? Like, I mean, they are like yucking it up and it is kind of unprecedented in such a messed up situation. But hey, I suppose in the most unexpected of circumstances, this has been the icebreaker and the conduit that they've needed to just kind of reconnect to that camaraderie and that energy that they've been missing. This next scene ends up being a little bit of a fake out. And I was like, hold up, what's going on? Because we see the in memoriam page of Kelly and we see everyone talking about how much, what they loved about her. And they're going into all these detail about how much she meant to them. I was like, uh, but no, of course, Kelly is there and they are just making sure they're taking the time to affirm her as a friend and give her her flowers and just let her know how much she means to them all. Just so that she can understand that, hey, you're more than just funny. You're more than just the stanky leg. You know, you are a valued friend and we love you and we care about you. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Them, even though Derek was just like, y'all doing the most. <laughs> Molly decides to ask Issa what her thoughts are on her potentially reuniting with Omari. To Issa, she feels like the whole situation with Omari represented how Molly used to be. The fact that she could just go with the flow and take a situation for what it was. And that's something that Issa really loved about her. Molly's like, yeah, well, that's when I thought I had all the time in the world. And Issa's like, you know what? I really don't want to get stuck or bogged down in where I'm not or what I'm not. Honestly, I just, I want to keep moving forward. And Molly agrees. Let's move forward. So as we move towards the end of the episode, we see our girl Kelly with a really nice setup for her podcast, Pretty's Preguntas. (laughs) What I love about this is if you go back to the season one finale, It was the episode where they were celebrating Kelly's birthday. And Kelly and Issa were having this whole conversation. Issa was trying to bring up all the mess with Lawrence. And Kelly was basically like, did he hit you? No? Okay. Are you pregnant? No? Okay. So when one of those two things happen, then we can talk. Otherwise, let's talk about the fact that it's my birthday. Because it's about me. And Issa's just like, okay, do you listen to yourself when you speak? And Kelly's like, all the time, I have a podcast. (laughs) And of course, she said it so matter-of-factly too. But I love that we have circled right back around and that we are now seeing the podcast that she was talking about. I love the continuity there and just the little details. Like, I love when shows do that. So Kelly decides to leave her listeners with food for thought. If you knew the end was coming, how would you make the most of your time left? What legacy would you leave behind? Is there anything you would change? We then see Issa arriving back in Los Angeles. And of all the people that I thought I was going to see, it was not Lawrence, (laughs) honestly. He's picking her up from the airport and she gives him a kiss and a hug. So I was just like, oh, okay. So um, I guess we're back on track. We see Derek, Tiffany, and their daughter, Simone. We see Molly and her French bulldog, Flavor Flay. (laughs) Still cannot believe that that is his name. Issa and Lawrence have a little small talk in the car about the moon and picking something up to eat. But when they pull up and Issa gets out of the car, she walks up to Lawrence and she just stands there and stares at him. And I was like, oh, (laughs) okay, I already know what this is. She lets him know that she had time to think. But of course, she can't get the words out, but you can see the tears welling in her eyes. Lawrence sees that and he already knows. There's nothing to say. 
he knows what decision she's finally made. But it doesn't make it any easier. And we can see that he has tears in his eyes also. So Issa walks away and it looks like this is her final goodbye to Lawrence. Whew, and that wraps up episode one, Reunited. Okay, I have to say this was a different kind of season premiere. I think a lot of that is the change of locale and you know the university surroundings and I think we're just used to seeing these characters in a particular setting and interacting in a particular way. I know some people weren't feeling it but I didn't think it was a bad episode and I know that some people also didn't like the slower pace but I was fine with that and we also had that with episodes like Loki Dunn and Loki Trippin which was centered around Issa and then Molly respectively which I actually enjoyed. I thought it was a nice change of pace. However, <laughs> I also understand that we are only getting 30 minutes per episode and only 10 episodes this season. So I can kind of get that we really need to make the time count. So even an episode like this that in theory is intriguing and is interesting, there's not much there in the way of story progression except maybe at the end. And there's not a lot of the quirkiness and the same vibe that we're used to. And you know, I can't really be mad at that. But I am interested in seeing where things progress from here. I like some of the themes and the concepts that were discussed in this episode. I was thinking that when it comes to Cheyenne's character, she kept reiterating throughout the episode, ain't sh changed. And you do have some people that are just doomed to just stay stuck in a certain place in their lives. No real progression. We're just kind of doing the same thing over and over again. Same cycle, same pattern. And then you have Derek and Tiffany, whose lives are very structured, very organized. They have the perfect plan. But then that all gets disrupted by their daughter, Simone, because they didn't plan to have her. But they are working through it and they are trying to make the best of it, even despite the challenges. With Kelly, it's the fact that she's smart, she's intelligent, she's accomplished, and she has a lot to offer. But now she is questioning her own legacy, her own impact in other people's lives, and just really trying to make sense of what that really means. And it's somewhat similar with Issa and Molly. They both have made strides professionally, but their lives are kind of in this place of uncertainty. Yet and still, even though they are questioning a lot right now, they have resolved to make the most of it and just move forward. And so I love the different perspectives on time and legacy and growth and maturity and just life. And that's something that I love about Insecure in general. I mean, it's funny, it's quirky, we get a whole lot of mess and silliness. But underneath it all, there's always a significant message and some really great subtext there. And I'm always here for that. And judging from that season preview, uh, we have a lot to look forward to. So I definitely can't wait to see it. So once again, this is D, Movie Man. Signing off. And I'll see you with the movie.